How is everybody? Good. Good? Got your food, you filled up. A couple of you nodding off over there. I already saw you taking a nap. Listen, I am, uh, I'm honored to be here today. It was really fun to be able to walk around and get to know you guys and talk to you. Um, you better check those photos, though, because uh, either you're not going to be in them or my head's not going to be in them. Our <laughs> photographer was a little shaky, but no, he did a great job. Um, so I was invited here to, to speak to you guys, and you know, whenever I'm invited to, to something like this, I try to do my research, right, um, about the industry, and then I realized that you know, I, I probably directly, you're gonna, I guess you're gonna get enough industry specific stuff while you're here, right? I mean, this, um, and the first thing I think we ought to be grateful for is that we can be here together. I miss this, really miss this. And I know your business is about this, right? It's about being personable with people, right? I love walking around and, and meeting you, all of you and shaking your hands and being able to, you know, not have to worry about, you know, the, the COVID thing. I know it's still there, but it's getting better. And hopefully we're all doing our part. It just has affected everything that we do. I mean, I remember the first time I walked into a bank with a mask on, right? It's like, something's wrong with this, <laughs> right? But sports, sports is back, and it's really good to, to be able to, to call games for the best team in the NBA right now, right? And I just need all of you to know there's one guy in here that told me he was a Laker fan who wasn't clapping. So I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna call him out. He know who's, he know, I think he left. Yeah. Uh, no. But um, what about the Jazz? And I was sitting there, I was talking to the Schoonovers, I was talking to Ralph here, and he, the question was, are they the real deal? They are the real deal. They really are. And I, I believe they have as good a chance as any team in the league right now to win an NBA championship, and that would be great for the state. So, um, you know, it's, it really is about, I mean, just like your businesses, right? It really is about getting to the next level. And building a team like the Jazz have built it takes a while. Some, some teams will go out and try to recruit three or four superstars, right? Because they, they, they're not that patient. They want success. And that doesn't always work out that way. I mean, LeBron's been able to be successful with it throughout his career. But what the Jazz have right now takes time. If you really understand how the Jazz operate, um, I would say arguably their best two players on the team. Donovan Mitchell, and Rudy Gobert, right? So you have to have those kind of anchors to anchor a team and to build around. But what the Jazz have created takes years to do. Um, and so if you notice how they work, they're a really good defensive team, which allows them to be a really good offensive team. It's important for them to be really good at the three-point line because it's simple. They figure if the other team's not necessarily good at the three, if you can stop them from hitting threes, three is big, three is more than two. We hit enough threes, they don't have a chance, right? So it's a little bit more than that, but I just wanted to start out. That, this is not part of my talk, by the way. I'm just, uh, I'm just such a fan of the team I work for, and it's great to see this city, this state be rewarded with a great team. Now all they have to do is get to that next level and bring home a championship. So I wanted to get that out of the way first. But it does relate to you in, in a sense that all of you have teams, right? All of you have, have businesses that you've, many of you have had for a long time that have been in your family for generations, right? And, and it really is kind of the same concept Right? You want to build something, you, want to, you have an ultimate goal in your mind that you've painted, that you want to be great at what you do, you want to be the best. And so you go and you, you partner with folks and you go get those people who can help you get there. So, but let me tell you a quick story. I, I played basketball over in Europe as well. I didn't just play in the NBA. I played 
The Jazz drafted me out of uh, North Carolina State, and um, that senior year at NC State, our college team won an, won an NCAA championship. So we really started March Madness, um, what they call March Madness today. And the reason that our story, and when you get a copy of this book, you'll read some of that, our story has been so important in that whole scheme of, of success in sports is that nobody knew who we were, right? We were just this team that was flying under the radar and um, nobody really knew who NC State was. Whenever you said North Carolina, they thought about this other team, they, their uniforms were about that, that color, right? And they had a Hall of Fame coach, Dean Smith. They had a uh, Sam Perkins, Brad Doherty, keep forgetting that other guy's name they had. Um, oh yeah, Michael freaking Jordan. <laughs> right, so nobody was thinking about NC State. And here comes this team out of nowhere. Right, out of nowhere. A team, if you understand how the NCAA tournament works, you have to have a certain resume to even get in there. We didn't have that resume. We were 16 and 10 after our regular season. So in order for us to get a bid into the NCAA tournament, we had to win that tournament outright. And we did that. Um, but this team kind of came out of nowhere and just shocked the world. 99% of folks who were following the tournament didn't think we had a chance. And I'll get to why we knew we had a great chance. But I played basketball in Europe after my Jazz stint. The Jazz traded me, it was a business deal. They traded me to the Minnesota Timberwolves and I played for the Timberwolves for three years and then I decided I was gonna go let basketball take me on this, this journey. I went over to Greece and I played for a year and I played four years in Italy. And something happened to me in Italy. It was, I was kinda at my prime as an athlete, right, I was still you know, producing and playing well. But I was getting towards that second half, right? The second half of the career when, like when you, when you get to a certain point in your career, all of us are like this, then you start thinking about what's next or what happens if I didn't have this or, and so I think I was at that, that point. I was still enjoying basketball and, and still doing well. But something happened to me one particular day. I was driving from my home in a place called Como. I don't know if you've ever been to northern Italy, but there's a place called Como, Italy that uh, I played. It's about a half hour from Milan on one side and a half hour from Lugano, Switzerland on the other side. So during my days off with this Italian team I played for, I would take a drive and Sometimes I would go over to Switzerland for different things, right? I mean, I, I, I've been in Italy for a long time, and if you've ever been there, you can't beat the food, man. It's just, it's, it's a passion for them. But sometimes I miss the U.S., because I've been over there for so long. So I knew that in Switzerland, right off the exit, if once I got into Switzerland, there was a McDonald's, like right off the, the exit. And I needed a taste of the U.S. every now and then, so I would make that trip. It's about a 30-minute drive. And every time I'd make that trip, there was one thing that ceremoniously happened. I had to stop at the border. So I would stop. I knew what was going to happen. I had done it many times. Once I stopped, I rolled my window down. The Border Patrol person with an AK-47 would walk over to your car, give you this look, and ask for your visa and your passport. And so I can't tell you the number of times that I had done that before that particular day. It was a lot, so I knew the routine. This day was no different at that point. I rolled my window down, the lady came over, and she proceeded to ask me the same three questions that I always heard when I came to the border to go over into Switzerland. The first question she would ask, she wanted to know where I was, just, where I was coming from. Where are you coming from, sir? And I'd tell her. And then I'd wait for the second question. She'd say, um, what's your purpose for being here today? 
and I'd tell her what my purpose was. And she wanted to know one more thing before she would either let me go or think I was suspicious and keep me longer, which never happened. But the last question she asked me was, where was, what's my destination? What's your destination today? So I answered that question, and like every other time, I drove off. Wherever I was going that day, McDonald's, wherever it was, I didn't make it that day. I remember it like it was today. I drove, I drove about a couple of kilometers down the road, and all of a sudden I stopped. I saw an empty parking lot, and I pulled over in that parking lot, and I sat there for a minute. And I started going over those three questions that she had asked me. I don't know why it was any different today than it was any other day. Maybe there were some things going on in my life that made me think a little bit more that day. But I sat there and I started with each question and I started to relate it to other things. First question she asked me was where I was coming from. The first thing that hit my mind was my past, right? Where are you coming from? That, my past. So I'm sitting there thinking about, man, that's, that's a pretty deep question. I'm, I'm all alone in this car, and I'm thinking these, these deep thoughts about three questions. My past, because my past was important to me. I kind of went back to where I grew up in Washington, D.C., and, and I was thinking some of the little stupid things I would do. I was thinking of some great times I had with friends and family. I was thinking of things that I probably wish I wasn't thinking about because they, were, they, they could have taken me down a different path if I hadn't made the right decision. I was thinking about maybe some things that I may have a little regret that I didn't do at the time that I knew if I did it, it could be a really good thing for not just me, but for other people. I got to the second question after I reminisced about my past, and she asked me what my purpose was for being here today. Purpose, purpose. Well, I really believed especially as an adult, that we all have a purpose, right? And that purpose could be with our, what we decide to do with our businesses. Right? What's our purpose? Why are we going into business? Why is this important for us? Um, besides your business, we have lives. We're moms, we're dads, we're grandparents, we're uncles and aunts. What's that purpose mean for us? And I believe, I truly believe that there is a singular purpose that we all should be a part of, and that's service, right? And a lot of you may be doing that in your businesses as well, but to serve others. So I'm thinking, I'm thinking about these questions, and I'm thinking about myself, well, service um, or purpose. What am, I, what am I here to do? What am I here to be doing and, and, and completing and making an impact with? Yeah, I'm sitting in my car doing this, right? Kind of crazy. Stomach growling, no, I want a Big Mac, but I, I'm, these questions are deep. Got to the last question. What's your destination, sir? I'm thinking, that one's easy. Where do I see myself? If I couldn't play basketball next week, would I be prepared to do something else, to transition into something else? Where do I see myself five years from now, as a dad, financially, in business with someone. So when I was done in that parking lot, basically what I had done was I created this kind of promise to myself that I would revisit those three questions in different phases of my life as kind of a scoreboard, as kind of a checklist, or whether it's as a dad, you know, how was my dad with me? What did I learn from him? As my purpose, how am I as a father? Right, I know I've got work to do, but am I paying enough attention to my kids and giving them that quality time that they deserve? Life in the NBA took me away from a lot of those things. Those are the choices I made. And the last question was, you know, where do I see myself? Or what are my goals? So, if nothing else before this day is over, I hope that those three questions, one, that you can remember 
your past and how important that was. Think about where you are right now and, and what you've built and where that came from and how much work had to go into it. Why you're here. Think about why you do things. Is it just for the income? Is it to build part of your legacy for folks that rely on you? Is it to serve others? Because I know I need you. Is it to use your platform? Everybody has one. You know, mine may stick out a little bit because it's kind of in the public eye, but I have a platform that I can choose how I want to use it. And you've seen people like me who've been in my shoes not use it in the right way and abuse it. And where is, what's your destination? Look what you've built. Where do you want to go to? What's that ultimate goal that you want to reach? You, you okay with the status quo? Or is there something, can you do better? Can you find those people who can be instrumental in helping you get there? Are you territorial? I was talking to a gentleman on my little tour, and um, he said something to me that really stuck out. He said, we're all friends in the plumbing business. And that really, that really struck me, because it's not like that in all industries, right? I mean, yeah, there's some competition there. But I was really pleased to hear that. So those three questions are three questions I, I hope that every now and then you think about in different parts of your life. Speaking of past, I'm going to go back a little bit. I'm going to take you back. Because I wasn't always a, bas a good basketball player. As a matter of fact, music was my true first love. My parents bought me this close and play record player. And we're all old enough in here to know what a record player was. It was a close and play. And it had these 45, these little black discs with a hole in it, right? And it had one song on each side. Boy, those were the days. <laughs> and if you couldn't find that little red thing, you were screwed. <laughs> but music was my thing. I would wake up in the morning going to school, and my, my parents would be dancing to the sounds of music to the, in the living room. And I would, I would walk in there, and they'd be dancing before I'd go to school. And it taught me a lot. Music... I gained a great appreciation because of what it reminded me of, right? Music to them was important because it brought them together in a loving way. And so I, that registered with me. And so I always kept music in my life. As a matter of fact, um, you know, I've got music out, but I played a couple of instruments in, in school. And uh, I joke, but years later when the jazz drafted me, I was such a music lover, I was like, okay, that's one step closer to being the Osmond brother right there. <laughs> but, but I wasn't in the basketball. And I remember the day that basketball became an important part of, of who I wanted to be in my life. I'm walking, I'm going to take you on this, this journey because I'm, I'm walking through my living room and my dad's sitting on my mom's Man, I can see it right now. My mom's forest green couch. And you couldn't spill on mama's couch either. She had this real thick, clear plastic on it, right? You spill something, it rolled right off onto a little carpet she had down there. And, and in front of my dad, as I was walking through, he, I could see him watching on this cart with wheels, our Zenith TV set. Zenith. Matter of fact, sometimes when my dad was watching a program, because, you know, we didn't have, we had the antennas that came off the back. Sometimes the pitch, it only had three channels, right? I had to stand there and kind of hold it while my dad was watching the show. Right there, son, you just hold it right there for a minute. Matter of fact, I think the knob was broken off the TV, and we had to turn that thing with, you had, did you have that TV? Did your knob break off? What did you turn it with? You had that same TV, didn't you? <laughs> I digress, but my dad was watching this TV. And I, I thought we invented high definition because, you know, we had aluminum foil, right? You put that aluminum foil, okay, all right. But my dad was watching a basketball game that day. And I didn't know anything about basketball. 
I'm probably 12, 13 years old, I'm 6'5", and I'm into music and school. Education was important. I grew up in Washington, D.C., so, you know, I, I, I was born in the 60s. So right at that time, I was going to grade school, junior high, it was, you know, busing, desegregation, and all that stuff going on. So education was stressed. My mom would always say, I don't ever, my mom was from the South. I don't mean Southern Utah either. My mom, <laughs> my mom didn't play. And she said, I don't ever, yeah, let me say it like she said it, I bet not ever see a C or below on your report card, son. And you know, as a kid, right, you're going through school, you think like a C, that's passing, right? I'm, at least I'm passing. I didn't say that to her. But she basically said, listen, a C is average. And I don't raise average kids. So I don't want to see a C or below on your report card. Because what is going to help you become successful at this time is your education. You need to learn, you need to listen, learn a trade. And so uh, my mom didn't play, so I, we didn't mess around with that. We knew that our education was going to be our ticket out of that, that rough neighborhood. But I sit next to my dad, and he's watching this basketball game, and I didn't know what was going on. So I'm going back and forth from the TV to him. Dad, what's, what did he do? Oh, Dad, those shorts are cool, huh? Yeah, they're pretty cool. Can I get a pair, Dad? And so my dad was getting a little frustrated, maybe, because I didn't know enough about the game, and here I am, 6'4", six, 6'5", six, already. But he was patient. And all of a sudden, I just, my eyes just stayed on the TV set because I saw one guy doing something so incredible I couldn't take my eyes off him. First of all, he looked cool with the shorts and the, and the jersey, and he had an afro that came out to about right here, and it was the coolest thing, because he turned, he turned to run down the court, his, his afro turned about two seconds later and caught up and just flew down the court. And he got down on the other end of the court with the ball in his hand, and it looked like a grapefruit. His hands were so big, and he made the most incredible flying move, decide in the air what you're going to do that I'd ever seen in my life. I didn't know human beings could, could fly like that. And so you know when you see something, even as a kid or as an adult, you hear or you see something, because I know like you watch America's Got Talent or The Voice, and you hear these people sing or play an instrument, and it, it just makes your heart jump a little bit, right? It's exciting. And then some of us are going, man, I shouldn't have gave up on those piano lessons years ago, right? And, but there's something that happens when you are inspired by somebody. And this guy I was watching inspired me. Dad, who's that guy? And my dad looked at me weird like I should have known who he was. He said, son, that's Dr. J. Dr. J. I said, dad, doctors can play professional sports? <laughs> I actually asked my dad that. And he began to school me on who Dr. J was, one of the greatest athletes ever, son. I fell in love with that man. I didn't even know a lot about him, but I was about to find out because I decided I wanted to be him that day. I wanted to grow my, my hair out, right? I wanted to, my dad to go get me a pair of shorts, and I wanted my dad to clip out every single article he could find about Dr. J in the magazine. I was going to be that man. I also wanted to learn how to play like him, right? And, and sometimes those exciting moments are fleeting, right? The, the next day the game's over, you just kind of go back. But no, it stayed with me. I asked my dad if he could teach me how to play basketball. My dad would, first of all, he was super excited that I wanted to play sports. So he went outside and, and he had this uh, garbage can. He took a saw and he cut about that deep nailed it to the house, nailed it right up there, and he found this old basketball, and he came out and started talking to me about the fundamentals, the basics of basketball. Right? He taught me a few things. He taught me how to hold my arm and shoot. He put, even put names to things like follow-through. And my dad was the kind of dad, I'm sure there's some dads and grandpas in here like this, like when you're explaining stuff to like a kid or a young person that, that is excited, 
sometimes you relate those things to other things like real life things. So my dad was talking about follow through and he associated that with like, son, when you tell somebody you're gonna do something, you follow through with it, right? So my dad would get, get on his little education tangents. I think what he was doing was hoping if I didn't get it then that someday it would register when I got to a certain point in my life. So he taught me a few things. And he, started, he built me this catalog, to all, all things Dr. J. So my seventh grade year, I'm walking down the hall and on right above the gym door, because you know I've got my plan, right? You need a plan. If you're going to try to attack something or attempt something or reach a goal, you've got to have a plan. And that was my plan. My plan was I'm going to learn all things Dr. J. I'm going to try to follow his success path. You know what all the motivational speakers say. Success leaves clues, right? So if I can read about Dr. J and see what he did in junior high school and, and watch his games and follow his moves, okay. So junior high school, basketball tryout, such and such a date, time, I'm going to be there. I walked into my first basketball tryout in my life. Right? Organized basketball. I walked into that gym and there were 60 other kids trying out for the team. I walked in those doors and I stood there looking for a minute because my dad taught me a few things, but this was, you know, I was green. I couldn't play. But as soon as I walked in there and I looked at the group, I did this. I got really confident. I told you I was 6'5", right? The next tallest guy in this room has got to be five, four maybe? And there's 60 of them. There's 60 of them. So my academic mind started to, the wheels started to turn. Okay, I know a little bit about basketball. I know that the rim is 10 feet from the floor. I know that I'm closer to this rim than anybody in this room. So my chances of making this team, I mean, put yourself in my shoes, right? You're in. So I walk in and Coach Gray, that's his real name, Coach Gray puts us all together. He puts us in a line. I'm somewhere in the middle, so you could see the thing go like this. And he says, guys, I'm going to look at your, your skills right away so I can know what group to put you in and know, you know where we need to start with this tryout. So he put the ball on the end, and he said, I want to see you dribble. And unfortunately, my dad taught me a few things, but he didn't get to the part where you took the ball and you hit it and it came back. And you hit it again and it came back. And at times you had to hit it and walk with it. I hadn't gotten to that. So the coach put the ball on the end with, the, with the, the little guy. And he went to work, man. He was down here. His eyes were up. He wasn't even looking at the ball, which I thought was incredible. So he's dribbling that thing. He passes it up. And I'm standing in the middle, nervous as all get out. First of all, I'm wearing a size 15 shoe. And the ball comes to me, and first thing I did was I put that ball down, not thinking about, because I was wearing these too, because you know, we used to play in these things. That's all we had were Chuck Taylors back in the day. Now they're a fashion statement. That ball hit the tip of my chucks and went all the way down the other end of the court. And I ran down and got it, and I'm ready to do it again, and coach says, next. So I give it to the little guy right there, and he's showing off, right? And we went through about an hour and a half of, like, testing. That was the hardest day I'd ever had in my life. And I wasn't good at many of those drills. Matter of fact, I wasn't good at any of them. Because they didn't do the drill where you just catch it and put it in, right? They didn't have that one. I would have won that one. So I went home, and I'm thinking, listen, I'm 6'5". I know they need tall people in this game. So I couldn't sleep that night. I was so excited to get back to school the next day because on the coach's door, there's a piece of paper. You know what's on that paper? The names of the players, right? We didn't have email and all that back then. So that's how we found out whether we made the team or not. We come to school the next morning, we go down on the coach's door, and there's the list. Man, I got off that bus and ran down the hall and got to his door. And I stared at that piece. Matter of fact, I think I took it and looked underneath it. 
because my name wasn't there. My name wasn't on that piece of paper. And for the first time in my young life, I don't know if you can think of the first time you failed. Think of the first time you failed at something that you really cared about. I'm standing there and my, I'm pretending something got in my eye, right? And all these other little dudes are giving each other low fives because they made the team. <laughs> and so that was really the first time that I felt the pain of failure. And I don't know if you felt that. Maybe you felt that in your business. Maybe you felt that in a relationship or something, but that's not a good feeling. And that was my really my first taste of it as a, as, a, as a teenager. And as I walked away that day, I just, you know, in my mind, I was like, I was that much further from my dream and my goal, which was really crazy. Maybe I didn't tell anybody else what I wanted to be or who I wanted to be. I just wanted to be Dr. J, right? I didn't tell my dad that's why I wanted to play because I knew they would think it was silly. But you're young, right? You bounce back. We all do it, hopefully at that age. We got people that pat us on the back and, and we put the work in and maybe there's another opportunity coming my eighth grade year, I'm six, seven. Right, I'm six, seven in the eighth grade. I see the gym door poster tryouts, didn't hesitate, knew I was going back in there. Because not everybody does, right? Not everybody does after that painful feeling of, of failure. Sometimes you want to you stay away from it. Maybe try something, go a new route, try something a little easier. But no, I walked into that gym. Coach Gray brings us all in. I was a little bit better. I worked on my game. I'd be out in my yard on my makeshift court before the sun went down, sometimes by myself, working on things. I'd always end with this game. My team's down by a point. Five seconds on the clock. I've got the ball. But you're never you, are you? You're always your guy. I was always Dr. J. Came back the next day, looked at the piece of paper on the door, and guess what? No name. Six, seven. You know those other 50, 60 guys? None of them had grown an inch. So the second time, how many of you have failed at the second time, twice at something you were passionate about. What'd you do then? What kind of, what'd that feel like? You put the work in, you know it's your moment, it's your time, but again, you're not good enough. And what happens that second time? The second time, you need something a little extra, right? It's not just about walking away. You gotta make some decisions. Am I gonna stick with this? Do I love it enough to stay with it? Um, I don't know if I did. But I think I got what I needed as I was walking away that second year. I heard my name, Thurl. I turned around and it was Coach coming out of his office. Coach had just cut me. Thurl, come here. I walked over in front of him and he stood in front of me like this. He crossed his arms like this and he looked up at me like this. <laughs> this is what he told me. And I've got it down word for word, pretty much. Son, you weren't meant to play the sport. I don't have time to teach you how to play basketball. I'm looking for guys who can help me win a championship this year. That's what he said. Oh, he wasn't done. He said, you're wasting my time. Don't come out for my team. I had one more year at the school. Don't come out for my team next year because you'll be wasting your time and mine. And so I just received maybe what I needed from a guy who probably knew more than I did about the game, who in my eyes was in, in that leadership position. I mean, we've all met him. Maybe in your industry, you met some folks who told you that maybe you're in the wrong industry. So I walked away that day basically saying, you know, my silly dream of being Dr. J, maybe that was just a fantasy or something. 
So I didn't know what I was going to do. I still have my, you know, the folks who always give you that support and that pat on the back. You know, if you really love it. I always found myself in the yard, though, you know, because I was, even if being Dr. J was only going to come as close as the, my front yard, I was going to be okay with that. But I still worked on my game. I know what Coach Grace said. And maybe, I, maybe something else will come along and I'll get an opportunity to, to get good enough. So I kept working on my game. My ninth grade year, my last year of junior high school, 6'9". Six, 6'9". Nine. Six, nine. And I walked down the hall, right? I knew the poster was above the door. I didn't want to look at it. It was painful, painful to look at it. But there were some days I, just, I, I, couldn't, I couldn't help it, right? So I'd look up and there was something still there. There was still a, a passion there. And as you all know, if you decide that you're going to continue to pursue something, what does that end up doing? It ends up opening up opportunities somewhere, somehow. That's what that perseverance and hard work does. I found out that Coach Gray, he didn't win a championship at that school, but I guess he did good enough to be hired at another school. So he left. They hired a new coach. I didn't know that coach. He didn't know me. Never met him. But I knew tryouts were coming up soon. Why in the world would I even go back into that gym after the two years I just had? After the two years of failure, what would drive me to go back in there? And I would even ask you that and what you do and what you've done. What took you back? Or maybe you didn't go back. And I think some of that would be passion. It has to be. Passion brought me to that door again, my last year, with a coach I'd never met. He'd never seen me. But I'm walking up to the door with everybody else, and he's outside the door, shaking every hand that goes in. Every single hand. I thought it was kind of strange. Come on in, guys. Come on in. We all get in there. He closes the door, looks at his watch. He said, listen up. And there's 50, 60 of us in there. Congratulations, all of you. We kind of looked at each other like, did we all make it? <laughs> Congratulations. Congratulations for walking through those doors. And that was the first step you guys needed to take. Because I can guarantee you there's some boys who wanted to be in here but decided not to walk through those doors. I think we can put together a pretty good team this year. Can't keep all of you, but good luck. It was just a different atmosphere, even throughout the practice. I think all of us in that room thought we had a shot. That's how he made us feel, like we had a chance. And if I wasn't the worst player in that room, I was standing right next to him. Right? I was probably the second worst. That coach, that leader, I think went around to every single player that day and said something on a positive level, taught them something. Came up to me and said, Thurl, good job. You're, you can be a, I think you can be a really good shot blocker. Thanks, coach. Made me feel good. I'd be guarding a shorter guy. He'd shoot it. I'd put my hand up. Ball would hit my hand. That's a blocked shot in basketball, for sure. <laughs> but he made, he made everybody feel positive. Like, you know, if I give it all I've got, then I've got as good a shot as the guy right there. Came back the next day, meandered slowly down to the coach's office, looked at the piece of paper. Matter of fact, I didn't even get all the way up there. I, I was about six feet or so away, and I could see it coming into focus. Happiest day of my life. I saw my name come. It was pretty cool because my name was the first one. It was right at the top. So you know when he's making that list out, the first thought that comes to his mind, Thurl Bailey. It was cool until I realized it was alphabetical order. <laughs> it's got to mean something. <laughs> but I, I, was, I cried. I was so excited that I made that basketball team. And there were like 13 other names on it. 
but my name was at the top of that list and I was, I was beside myself. I couldn't wait to get home and tell my folks, right, that I had finally made the team. And in my mind, I know, I, I'm thinking that, look, I wasn't the best player. There were some guys in there that were really, really good. Two days later, the coach calls me into his office. It scared me, because I'm thinking maybe he realized he made a mistake. But he called me in his office. He wasn't even in there when I got there. I sat in a chair, waiting on him. He walks in. I wasn't really making eye contact. I was just, you know. He sits on his desk in front of me, and he says, son, look at me. And this is what changed my life, right? We all have these moments in our lives that, that really cement something in it for us for the long haul. Something that we can use in everything that we do when we have a business and we're hiring folks or when we have kids or grandkids and we're talking to them about something. He said, son, look at me. If you want to be a great basketball player, you've got a lot of work to do, buddy. A lot, he emphasized. But if you want to be great and if you're willing to make a commitment to this, I will come in one hour before the team practices to work with you on some things. And after we get done practicing for two hours, I'll stay one hour later after to work with you. Who does that? I don't know who else he was talking to, but I just know I was the only one in his office at the time. And in my mind, I'm wondering, why would this man commit all this time to me? One hour with me, two hours with me and the team, and one hour with me after. And this is what changed everything for me. He said, son, will you look at me, please, while I'm, I'm, I'm going to tell you this. He looked me in the eyes, and he just pointed right at me. He said, I see potential. I see potential, and you don't even see in yourself. And I know to build what we want to build takes time. And I might not get that with you this year. This is your last year. But while I've got you right now, I can see something. If you're really serious about this and you make that commitment, and that commitment doesn't just mean on the court. It means being coachable everywhere. It means not being average in class. It means not hanging around with folks who don't have goals and they're going to suck the energy out of you so you don't have any. Coach, I, I want to commit. Committed that day. Committed. And you know, when you commit to something and you start to get success, right, other things just start to happen, right? They start to happen because you've worked hard. I started every single game in junior high school. I didn't think I was good enough. But I was a starter. That was big back then. Starting five, you know, you have these slow motion pictures in your mind of smoke and you're kind of walking out there with the other four guys. <laughs> right? You've had them. Coach said he needed the first possession of every game. It was important to him because he wanted to get the first possession to control the tempo. Well, how do you do that in basketball? Jump ball, come on. Coach, I'm your guy, I'm 6'9". Look at the team, there's no guy over 5'3". I went in the game and of course, in, in Sports, you have to have a game within a game. I wasn't about to let coach down on the jump ball. So every time I'd get up there and the guy would come up on the other side, right before the ref would come over, I'd walk up a little closer. I'd say, how you doing, little fella? <laughs> and he'd step back. Sometimes I'd catch him waving at his parents. I'd wave at his parents. <laughs> and then he frowned. I'd step closer. I'd say, see this jump ball? Don't even think about it. So I'd get him riled up, right, before the game would start. The ref would come and toss the ball up. That little guy would take off, usually early. I'd barely jump at all. I'd just reach up, tip the ball to my teammate. Coach was proud of me. Mom, my embarrassing mom, every game when I got the jump ball, that's my baby, that's my baby down there. <laughs> Coach would stand up and call a timeout as soon as we got it, every game, and take me out for the rest of the game. 
True story. I averaged 2.3 seconds per game in junior high school. It's okay, you laugh. I made the team, bro. I was on the starting five. Got every jump ball. Do you know what the conversation was on that 20-minute ride home after each game with my parents? Baby, that was a beautiful jump ball you got there today. I can't wait the next week. I wasn't good enough to play varsity my first year of high school. Played JV. I probably came into my own end of my junior year because I had folks that handed me off to other folks who saw that same potential because of my passion and hard work that I put into it. They were willing to work with me and sacrifice some of their time to make me better. Got scholarship offers. Chose North Carolina State University. Coach Norm Sloan was a legend. And back then in recruiting, you wanted to get the kid, who you talk to? Mom. Mom tells you where you're going to school. Coach Sloan came in, sat down. We loved him. Everybody loved him. Mom loved him especially. Son, you, this is where you're going. Okay, Mom. Congratulations, Coach. Where I signed. Went to NC State. Freshman season was, was pretty good. Hard-nosed coach. After that season was over, got an announcement that Coach Norm Sloan was leaving NC State to go to Florida. What? Talk about change. You talk about COVID and dealing with change. How tough is, how tough is it for us to deal with change that affects us? Not just us, everybody, everything. How do we deal with it? How do we survive with that kind of change going on? And I'm not trying to compare my coach leaving with COVID. My point is, is that change is very difficult for us sometimes when we feel like we've got this plan, right? And all of a sudden, this huge wrench just works its way in there. Now we got to reevaluate everything. We got to figure out where the income's coming in from. We got to give people bad news that we can't use you right now. It's a hard thing. It was a hard thing for me as a college kid to see a guy who, when your family says, Coach, I'm giving them to you, right? Make sure he gets his education. Don't make me have to come down there. That's my mom. Yes, ma'am. But we understand it's the business of basketball. He's gone. What am I going to do now? My first call was to my mom. Mom, Coach Sloan is gone. I'm coming home. I'm not staying here. My mom's answer, quoting her. Son, you may be going somewhere, but you're definitely not coming here. You went there to get your education. That's what you're going to get, whether it's there or somebody, somewhere else. You're going to get that degree. So I'm telling you to be patient. You don't know. You haven't met the guy yet who they're, who they're thinking about hiring. And as a young adult, you're like, I don't really care. Until you're sitting in this room, this small cafeteria, and in walks the new guy they hired. Happens in business too, right? They just put somebody, made them CEO. You're not used to this person. They don't know anything about you. What do you, you don't owe them anything. You didn't, you didn't even go through the process of recruiting me. So you, how, you, how are we going to listen to you? Little Italian man. He walks in the room with this like cool strut and doesn't say anything for a second. He introduces himself. Hey guys, I, I know how you feel, and let me introduce myself. My name's Jim Balvano. I'm your new head coach. And you know what we looked like. We were in our chairs, feet stretched out, looking at the floor. Didn't want to hear it. He said, I know, I know how you feel. I know you only want to be here. But I'm going to speak to you for 25, 30 minutes. And at the end, when I'm done, if you still want to leave, I'll sign your release forms. Talk about risk. Talk about maybe losing eight or nine guys 
He said, yeah, I'll sign your papers. If you want to go, you can go. But listen to me first. Next words out of his mouth probably should have made me leave. I know I'm going to win a national championship, he said. That was, that, that was his first, like, motivational words. Guys, I know I'm going to win a national championship. Soon. Well, that's kind of selfish. You? How are you going to do that? We didn't say that, but we're thinking it. He said, guys, I've seen it. I've dreamt it. I know it's going to happen soon. I know it is. And I like it to be this team. I know what it looks like. I want you guys to see what I'm seeing, dream what I'm dreaming, and I know we can do it soon, guys. And we're all sitting there thinking, this man might have the wrong school. He might think he's down the road at that ugly blue and white school. No offense to your clothes, but that school. <laughs> yeah. So we're sitting there listening to this man sales pitch. He's selling it. He's painting this picture for us. You know, and some of us are looking at our watches, right? At the end of his speech, the first one he ever gave us, you felt like if you decided to go, you were going to miss something amazing. That's how good of a salesman he was. And he didn't just sell it like, you know, he sold it like he believed it, like he knew it was going to happen. Nobody left. We got to work. One of our first day, practice days, he walks in, he's running late, he brings a ladder into the practice. He puts it under the hoop. In his pocket, he pulls out a gold pair of scissors that he keeps on his desk. He says, today, for two hours, all we're going to do is practice cutting down the nets. Yeah, that's what we did. <laughs> yeah, right, really, Coach. Yeah, Thurl, you're going to go first. Everybody will follow you. I'll go up last. I'm going to cut it down, put it around my neck. You guys are going to pick me up and carry me around this 12,000-seat empty arena. You're going to scream and holler like you won the national championship. That's what we're going to do for two hours. I got lots of nets here. Awkward. You have no idea how awkward that was. We did it twice a month. The second time was just as awkward. I mean, woo! What do you, how do you, he said, guys, you need to, you need to picture yourself. Think about it. What would it feel like to you? What would you look like? What would you be doing? If you knew you, if you won the national championship, because this is the ceremony you're going to go through. Third time was awkward. Fourth time, okay. I think we were starting to feel something. And I think fourth or fifth time, we were, man, we were all in. We were tossing Coach B in the air and catching them. Guys were running up and down the stairs. This is a 12,000 seat arena we're practicing in. Guys were climbing up on the backboard, standing on the rim and celebrating and shouting. Students were poking their head in the door to see what in the world was going on in the gym. But he tried to explain to us that, guys, if you want to be champions, if you want to have that mindset, you got to be different. It's got to feel awkward to you. It's got to feel uncomfortable because it's a place you haven't been. We're not trying to stay safe. 1983, we end up in the NCAA tournament. We don't get into the tournament if we don't win our conference tournament. We have a 16 and 10 record. That's just not good enough. So we have to beat North Carolina with Michael Jordan, Virginia, and Wake Forest. We're in the tournament. We keep winning games. Crazy, crazy wins coming from behind. Nine points with less than a minute to go and no three-point shot. We come through Utah. We play Virginia, our easiest game, University of Utah. Sorry, no offense. <laughs> <laughs> and we find ourselves in the Final Four in Albuquerque, New Mexico. We beat Georgia, and now we're facing a team that I thought was an NBA team masquerading as college players. Five Slam a Jam and University of Houston Cougars. Akeem Olajuwon, Clyde Drexler, 
you don't know those names, Google them, they're Hall of Famers. Seven seconds left on the clock, game is tied. I get the ball in the left deep corner and I see my teammate Derek Wittenberg out by half court and I throw him a baseball pass. He grabs it and he heaves up this last second. He calls it a pass, but it was definitely a shot that's fallen short that my other teammate grabs out of midair, dunks it in. We win a national championship. The crowd rushes the floor. I fall to my knees, somebody picks me up off the floor. And the dust settles after maybe five, 10 minutes because it's time for the ceremony. They bring the ladder out, the NCAA folks bring the ladder out, they set it under the hoop. The NCAA man with the box, we know what's in the box. He brings it up, he opens it up, there's a pair of scissors in it so Coach V can start the ceremony and Coach V does this. Reaches into his pocket, pulls out the gold pair of scissors that we practice with twice a month, cutting down that true story. Pulls them out and we look at him like, are you kidding me? And we knew he was, he had some foresight and vision, but did he actually know we were going to win this thing? I played well. Played so well, the Jazz had the seventh pick in the first round. I'm in New York, Madison Square Garden. I hear my name called Thurl Bailey, Utah Jazz. Oh my goodness. Surreal. I walk and I grab the jazz cap and I find myself in Salt Lake City at the Salt Palace, sitting on the bench. Coach Frank Layden calls me into the game. Thurl, get in the game. I go in the game, we're playing the Philadelphia 76ers that night. I walk out before the game starts, I get a tap on my shoulder. I turn around and there's a big old hand that reaches out and says, Thurl, congratulations on a great college season. Welcome to the NBA. First thing I saw was the edge of a huge afro. It was Dr. J. Dr. J. Dr. J. The same Dr. J I watched on that black and white TV set with my dad. The same Dr. J with five seconds left on the clock. I was him in my yard. I'm on the court. I'm, I'm standing next to the man who started the passion for me. He wants to shake my hand. And his hand, his fingers were like an inch longer than mine. I knew everything about Dr. J. I've read somewhere that Dr. J had an extra knuckle in each finger. I don't know why I read it. Maybe the Inquirer or something. <laughs> I shook that man's hand and that full circle moment was right there. Best moment of my NBA career, right there with Dr. I scored a lot of points, played with some great players. Shaquille O'Neal fell on me once, I thought it was awesome. They're trying to help him up. No, Shaq, you're good. Stay here for a minute. <laughs> I came to my senses, though, because I looked out and my four teammates were guarding other players. I got to guard the great one. Think about that. Think about all this stuff. You talk about your past. That just came rushing, right? I'm standing here next to my idol. Now I'm going to guard him because we all want our moment, right? And if I work hard against Dr. J, whose picture do you think they're gonna have in the paper the next day? That's right. I think that was the hardest I ever worked in basketball. And I held Dr. J that night to 47 points. <laughs> There's no way he was gonna score 50 on me that night, I can tell you that. <laughs> and they had my picture in the paper with Dr. J slamming on me. I tell you that story because stories are important. That's my journey. That's part of my journey. That's part of the reason I'm standing up here today is because I know, I sat down here with Ralph for 10 minutes and Ralph took me on a ride. He took me on a journey. The Schoonovers, they could take me on a journey, tell me where they've been, tell me how how this family business got started. 
tell me the tough times. The journeys are important for every single person in this room. Because I believe in the end, you can have a great product. Sometimes that sells itself. But I think those stories, those things about you, sell. Those things about you are the most important things. When you're hiring someone, right, that you see something in them, right? Maybe a little raw. Why do you want to be in this business? Well, I can guarantee you that your story, your journey is going to be the most imp important thing that you can do. Because that, that's what you leave behind, right? It's that legacy. It's, it's all the things that you put into, all the love, all the anguish, all the tears, and not just in your business. But when you sit down with folks, stories are powerful. The journey is powerful. And I hope as you continue yours through all the stuff that's happened, and we've all been affected by it, that it becomes a great part of your story because you've come out of it. And quickly, there are, if you don't think you have a story, you're wrong. And there's several things to think about if you feel like, man, I, I, need, to, I need to grab that story. Because a lot of people don't think the stories are important. The call. The call is the first thing. What called you into it? Right? Ralph was telling me. Ralph, you, did, you didn't want to be in this business, did you? You didn't want to be in this industry. No. Who'd you meet on your mission? Another plumber. <laughs> That's, that was the call. That was the call. The next thing is, once you decide at some point in your journey, you're going to hit that pit moment. You know what the pit moment is? Think about that. It's easy. What's the pit moment? Just what it says. You're going to be at almost, if not rock bottom. Something's going to happen. I don't know any successful person, business that hasn't been in the pit. Sometimes the deepness varies, but everybody's there. And I know people who are still there because they didn't put the effort in climbing out of it. The next part is the search. If you really have a passion, you're going to search for answers. You're going to ask the right questions to the right people and figure it out. If you search long enough, what happens? You discover the discovery. You bring the right people on board. And then the last part is the result. And the result is all of us here being in this room, right, saying that this is our passion. This is our passion. Thank you so much for what you do and for what you teach. That, that purpose part, that service part, there's a lot of young people out here that need to learn how to work, need to learn a trade. Thank you for your efforts to keep that, that strength. I know I've talked long enough, um, but I'm grateful. I'm grateful for this opportunity to be able to come and share. And some of those stories that I talked about, you'll read in this book, um, it was the only good thing for me that came out of COVID was I got to finish it. But thank you so much. God bless all of you. Take care of each other and yourselves and great fortune to you in, in your businesses. Thank you so much. Appreciate it. Can you answer a few questions? Yeah, yeah. If they have time. Do you have any questions? Anybody have any questions? I'll take a few questions. It can be about anything. Did you take your mom's job? Oh, man, did I. I did. She would have been proud anyway. Um, the biggest question I get is the coach that cut me twice, yeah. right? Uh, did you go rub it in, Big T, when you made it to the NBA? <laughs> I, I didn't rub it in. I didn't really think about rubbing it in. This is what I did. I knew we were going to play the, the, the Bullets, which are now the Wizards. 
so before I got there, I, I searched him out. I called him, Coach Gray, uh, coming into town. Would love to get together. He's sitting in front of me, and I said, Coach, thank you. Thank you, Coach. Thank you for helping me decide what I was passionate about. Right? I knew I wasn't ready. You had no obligation to keep me on the team, right? I mean, we have these lenses that we, a different coach sees a different thing in a person. Some are impatient, some want to win now, some want to take their time and develop. But I said, Coach, thank you. Here's five tickets to the game tonight. Because that's, what I, that's how I looked at him. He helped me. He helped me make a decision, right? And so even though his lens was different, I, I, I put him on that list of importance, right? Not everybody, you know, grabs you and cuddles you and says, no, there's some things that you have to hear to make decisions for yourself, right? Don't tell me there weren't people to talk to you out of doing what you're doing today. Don't tell me there weren't people that said you're in the wrong industry, bro. So hopefully that answered your question. My mom, God rest her soul, always proud, always proud. Yes? I apologize for this, Phil, but can you please tell us what you think we can do in this country to get past this horrific racial divide that we seem to be going through right now like we've never seen? The question was, if you didn't hear it, what we can do to get through this racial and social divide, and it really begins with what you just did, is having a conversation. I think a lot of times we're afraid to have, we think it's uncomfortable because maybe we don't know enough, right? And I'm not gonna lie to you, I grew up in DC, I got off the plane in Salt Lake City and it was the biggest culture shock of my life. Right? It was. I'm searching for black people. I'm like, I saw Joe on the corner on the way to practice. I waved to him, Joe, I'll see you tomorrow, bro. But the key is, is that when we can get to the point where we are informed and educated enough about each other, this is not just a black thing, right? The cop thing, that I, for me, that's training. That is somebody who took this job shouldn't have this job because there's something going on where their respect for human life uh, puts people's lives in, 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 in danger. So I think my, ver my answer to your question is I love people. I grew up in the 60s, my parents, if you ever seen those pictures of Martin Luther King's speech in Washington, D.C., you see that crowd, my parents are in there somewhere. I always look, see if I can pick them out. But they were in there and they taught us, right? They taught us, as kids, what was going on. They didn't teach us that every white person was bad. They said, you need to respect people. You need to know what's going on, but you need to understand that you need to be a part of the solution and not the problem. So we were educated growing up. And I knew when I came to a quote unquote foreign place, basketball had taken me a lot of places. The first thing wasn't color, right? It was this person, I'm with this person, they're a human being just like me, right? And let's talk about our past, let's talk about those things. Let's talk about what things mean to us, okay? You, you know, if you wanna carry a Confederate flag at home, tell me why you think that that is, I can tell you why I think it's hurtful, but we can agree to disagree and still survive together, right? I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna hate you. And so um, I, I, I guess the best way for me to answer that is we have to be willing, we have to be willing to teach and also know, learn what we don't know. Right? You talk about in business, asking the right questions to the right people to be successful. Right? I, I, listen, I went through that with my wife. How does a guy from Washington, D.C., 
find the girl from Richfield, Utah. <laughs> oh, how does a black guy <laughs> from Washington, D.C. find, fall in love with a girl from Richfield, Utah? That's a whole mini-series, bro, I'm telling you. <laughs> but there was a lot learned in there. I mean, I, I love your question, man. It's a lot learned in there, but sometimes we have to kind of reach out and what is it we don't know? What is it we're missing? What is it we disagree with? Maybe there's another perspective. Maybe not just, maybe, maybe I'm not right or wrong. It's just my perspective of things. And I need to figure out if that perspective is in line with today, right? And so I, I think it's education. I think it's getting uncomfortable a little bit. Right, and I don't want to belabor this answer, but when I first came here, and I, I have a dear friend who's my dear friend today, and I went to eat dinner with him for the first time. They were like a, um, you know, they have these families that are like, they assign to different players. And I went over to their house, and they had three kids, and the parents are sitting at the table, we're eating a great meal, and the kids get up, and they come over to my side of the table. They don't say anything, they just, they start rubbing on my, my hand, and they look at it, right? And it was starting to get a little awkward because <laughs> the parents were like, you know, they, they didn't know. They, they had never been in a situation, they had never had a black person over before, so they didn't really know any of the boundaries, right, that, or things that may be sensitive. And their kids, one, the son looked up at the dad and said, Dad, it doesn't come off. <laughs> oh, boy. How do you handle this? Could have handled it in a couple of ways. Could have got up, stormed out. You racist, I'm leaving. That's not, no. I knew these people were great people, and I knew these were kids. However, it was a potential teaching moment for the parents, but they didn't, they weren't equipped, right? They looked at it as maybe kids having fun, right? And I kind of looked at it as, okay, are these parents going to step up and teach their kids something like my parents taught me back then, but... Later we had a conversation, me and the parents, but just things like that, that I don't get offended at everything because I'm, I'm, I'm knowledgeable about a lot of stuff and I know that we're all human and none of us are perfect. And I think that if we knew each other better, we could find common ground on a lot of stuff. So I don't know if that's an answer for you. But that's how I approach it, right? I always try to be a bridge everywhere I go. Um, <clears throat> I get emotion about this topic but I, I, we could be so great together. It's a little hard, though, when you live in a state that has less than 3% of the population is black to, to learn and to understand what's going on in a lot of places in the country. It's really hard. It's hard, but not impossible. Agreed. Look at all the things we have at our access now. You may not be traveling, but if you really wanted to learn something, you really wanted to know something, and maybe you don't have, you know, friends or colleagues that are, you know, African American or people of color. Um, if you're really looking, and, and I'm going to be honest, like the Utah Jazz, if you're really looking to be a diverse company, then you can be, right? It's not just about finding what you're comfortable with and in your neighborhood. There are a lot of people of color that would love to be a part of a great organization. They're not coming to you, right? So what are you going to do to get in tune and in line with what we need to solve this whole issue? So um, I think it may be hard in some instances and circumstances, but there's enough education out there that gives us knowledge. And we know the nonsense from the other side. And, and I don't mean just from one side, right? I mean, this, this verdict that came down the other day, I was, I was really nervous on either, either way the verdict came out because, you know, it, something like that, something like that hits people in different ways. I think for the folks who, who are sensible, we understand that when we see everything and we have all the evidence that there's no disputing it, but I'll leave you with this. Um, the fact that you're, you're asking that question means that you care, and you care about the future of 
your kids and grandkids and, and where you live. And, and we are, I think we're, we're, we're doing better. I think we're getting to a point. It, and listen, it will never be solved. It will never be perfect, right? There's, there's forces on both sides that will always believe one thing. And so um, I, I appreciate you asking that question. I saw a hand go up right here. Does that mean I'm old? <laughs> no, go ahead, go ahead, go ahead, thank you. So, I'm curious, who were some of the most difficult players to guard? Not necessarily the best players, but some of the most difficult to guard, and why, and who were some of your best coaches or best coaches, and why? I'm gonna get right to who was the di most difficult person I ever had to guard in my entire life. Larry Bird. And people are like, really? He couldn't jump, he couldn't run. <laughs> he had an amazing IQ for the game. He had an amazing knack to know where to be, when to be there, how to get his shot off, how to be a clutch player. And you know, I'd be out there and I'd think I'm doing pretty good and I look at the stat sheet and he's got 50. Wow. But he just, he just had this knack, right? He just knew that he may not have been as athletic as other people, but he compensated for that with brilliance, right? And people talk about the myth, what they think is a myth, of him being in the Boston Garden and knowing where the dead spots are. No, he knew every single spot in that gym. And this was just a, you know, a country boy who loved the game of basketball. So he was the most difficult. I was a small forward. So I wasn't a center back then. Uh, and that's why I like what Rudy's doing right now because the game has kind of gone away from the, you know, the, 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 the old school center who posted up and you, know, you threw some elbows down low. It's more a three-point line now. But um, yeah, Larry Bird, coaching-wise, I had, I had great coaches all the way. I was very fortunate to go from Norm Sloan to Jim Valvano to um, to, who was my next coach? Frank Layden. Frank Layden hired Jerry Sloan. Um, I was fortunate, and to have Jerry for that long was amazing to me. So, yeah, as far as coaches and, and players to guard, uh, there were a lot of them, but Larry Bird was the guy who was so difficult for me to, me to guard. One, One more? Pretty much all of them. Um, I spoke with John Stockton last week, Carl Malone. I, um, we have a thing we're doing together in a couple of weeks. That's the thing you miss. I mean, if you could, if you could equate the locker room to what you do, you know what I'm talking about, right? Maybe your locker room is that your family, right? That that have have nurtured something great, um, and then. At some point, you go your separate ways. You may decide to do something else, but you never, you never get that back again, that locker room stuff. But what you do get is a lifelong relationship with people and players that affected your life. You know, people look at John Stockton, they look at his records and stuff. I mean, I know all that stuff, but he's my friend. I can call him and talk about the old times, and I can go up to his mom and dad's funeral and. So, yeah, we, we, we keep pretty close, uh, especially with that jazz team, because the organization, I don't know if I've talked to one of my Minnesota Timberwolves guys, because it was different, right? The jazz was about family. It was about development. It was about longevity. See how long Sloan stayed, right? Players just, coaches and players, you will never see that again, right? Pop, Greg Popovich may be one of the, the last guys, and players like John and Carl, Carl who played 19 years here, John who played like 20. Those days are gone, I believe. But um, yeah, we keep, you know, Brian Russell, the one that Michael Jordan pushed, right? <laughs> you still, you say that though. I, I believe it. I know, that's why I said it, because you believe it. I believe it. <laughs> <laughs>
<laughs> of course, every jazz fan believes it. What you <laughs> You're still mad about it, aren't you? <laughs> Uh, but I hope that, that answers your question. We still stay in touch. Um, thank you guys so much. I, I know I kept you like way over time, but I hope you enjoyed it. Thanks.